Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Blizzard Sarcophagus. Shall we dive in? Do you want to go first? I will, sure. Um, So I live in Canada, and an annual tradition in Canada is, and it arrives around sort of mid to late February usually, I think, is wondering just why the hell I live in Canada. (laughs) And, like, I like it all right, and there's things I like about it, and obviously I, I like my friends and family that... I know here and um but it it in a lot of ways February serves as a reminder that it is in many ways a very stupid place to live. <laughs> um as it's cold and dumb and snowy and yeah. Anyway. So the word I have today is blizzard. Nice. And so uh, a blizzard for those of you lucky enough not to know is uh um I'm just a word for a massive snowstorm. It's kind of like the it's peak Garbage winter weather, big snowstorm, lots of wind, can't see anything, the air hurts your face, and it's got tiny projectiles of ice that also hurt your face. Do you know how much we love snow here? Um, like, it, it's, I, I know, I, know I, I get it, I understand. Yeah. It is, you know, nobody would want to eat ice cream every day in the real world. However, right. we, like, that, I presume that as a kid, you didn't hate the snow. I presume that as a kid, it was still like Wonderland, fun, possible day off school kind of yay reaction. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. That, that that prevails. That's exactly how I still feel about snow. Yeah. I think what, like, what I should clarify, though, because I don't actually hate snow as a substance or even just winter as a time. The problem is, and this is why you love snow as a kid, but get fed up with winter right quick as an alleged grown up, is that you have to do stuff in spite of the snow as a grown-up, yeah. whereas as a kid, yeah, I get that. you do stuff with the snow. Someone helps you put a snowsuit on, and then you go and play, and then you go inside again. And But now it's like, I have to actually drive in this garbage or you see, shovel the walkway what, what, or something um, stupid. We are once again hitting into one of these big cultural differences that, that we occasionally uh, gleefully explore, but <laughs> nothing happens here when it's snowing because my country is idiotic when it comes to snow right and every time it does snow and I, you know I'm, I'm pretty sure we've talked about this in the past but every time it does snow and obviously it snows more in scotland than it does in england generally speaking because right. we're further north and it's not really that big a deal in scotland in terms of like getting things done there are parts of the country that are completely inaccessible when it snows in scotland because they have tiny little country roads and and that's that that will be the case in England too, but they just don't get that much snow. But yeah. when when snow dares to fall on places like London, you know, places that have establishing shots in films, right? Everyone loses their mind. Like nothing happens. Yeah. Because it's been snowing. So if if Britain was suddenly transposed to Canada, we would basically collapse within a couple of winters. Oh yeah, you'd you'd almost make it to Christmas if yeah, that. We respect Canada for its approach to snow, and it's, especially if you've seen the pictures of like I see the pictures of things called snowpocalypse in England, versus the <laughs> thing called snowpocalypse that hit Newfoundland this year. Yeah, yeah, that was hilarious. It's like a twenty-four hour time lapse, and then all people's cars are gone, and there's like you have to <laughs> shovel off to get out of your second story window. And yeah. As opposed to, ooh, it was a bit slippery today yeah. driving to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. So that thing that hit Newfoundland this winter was a blizzard. Nothing that ever hits the UK is ever a blizzard. <laughs> Apart from the great thunder snow of 2010, which got us a full four days off school. Wow, nice. Yeah, that, that, was, a, that was an event. That's a, that's we a all good remember one. it well. Nice. Well, Thunder Snow. It's even got a cool name. Yeah, the Thunder Snow was super cool. That's awesome. Right. Anyway, oh, sorry, Blizzard. Yes. Um, oh, sorry, I, I'm I'm a, I'm at peak interrupting this week. It would seem. <laughs> so, it's uh, it's a modern word, 
as the OED categorizes it. Uh, first written use. What does that actually mean? Well, the first written use of this one comes in 1829. Okay. So modernish, modern by the OED standards, which has citations from 688 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 1829 is just a pup, but it. We'll get into this a little bit down the road, but it, it's. This is one of those things. I, I like every now and then finding a word that's new because it's that much easier to see the difference between first use and first written use. You yeah, know, like, sure. Because it's stuff like newspapers, and they say, they say things like, these things are called this, which carries with it the automatic implication or explicit identification that the word is around before it's being used in print first. But the newer sources, it's kind of easier to tell. Yeah, and it's easier yeah, to remember, that's very true. and it's a good reminder for when we when we sort of speculate on, oh, this looks like this came first and this came first. It's it's a lot of speculation because there's just no way to tell most of the time, and we'll get into why this is a good example of that later. But um, so when I say originally it meant, insert grain of salt here, the earliest citation of it in the early 1800s, it meant a sharp blow or knock, or a shot. And that's in the OED as the first use. It was the first use in a Virginia Lit Museum is what it's cited as in 1829. Couldn't find anything. Virginia has a museum that's lit? I guess so. So lit. <laughs> um, the second, look at me. We're Look at us talking hip with the jive talking of the, the kids. Hello, I fellow children. I watched Book Smart this week. I know all the, the, the down with the children speech. <laughs> We're down with the children speech. Um the second citation, and this is interesting considering we just talked about Pioneer fairly recently, was a book by Colonel David Crockett. Davy, Davy Crockett. There we go. King of the Wild Frontier. I knew we'd have some singing. Well, that was much lower than I was anticipating. Yeah, I really dove down. <laughs> you did well, though. You stuck with it. It was good. Thanks. I, you have to commit to these you things. you got to just go with it. Yeah, so Colonel David Crockett, where he says, the quote, here is a gentleman at dinner asked me for a toast and supposing he meant to have some fun at my expense i concluded to go ahead and give him and his likes a blizzard which is neat mm -hmm. and also because yeah, we just talked about neat. toast fairly recently too we got tagged cool. on twitter as, as an aside about toast because uh in a recent history of english podcast kevin stroud also talked about toast and how oh, nice. people used to spice garbage wine with slightly lesser garbage bread and made that flavor, I don't know, whatever. The whole thing about toast. And someone tagged us on Twitter and was like, are you guys collaborating or something? Because you guys both talked about toast within like a week of each other. <laughs> you, you do know it's, it's these days unwise to mention Kevin's podcast because I am geeked out to the absolute max on it. Yeah, it's true. This is, it's, yeah. I, I'm, I'm only, I'm not like flying through it the way you can do with other podcasts because after listening to each episode, I need to spend a minimum of two days just going... Whoa! <laughs> it's it's like, like, oh my god! Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's so great. It's sort of binge-proof listening. It's good. Yeah. Um. So I thought that was an interesting. To apparently, so I naturally the other thing I like about these more modern sources is that you can actually often find the sources themselves in digital yeah, form sure. and look at them, which is neat. Not that you can't for the older ones, but it's harder. So I found it because I was like, I gotta find this book written by Davy Crockett. Uh, and luckily, he talks about the toast that he gave. Would you like to hear it? Would I? The toast he gives is, Here's wishing the bones of tyrant kings may answer in hell in place of gridirons to roast the souls of Tories on. Oh my god. <laughs> right? And then Why? he... People just don't word like that anymore, <laughs> they do they? They don't. And then he notes with, I think, some glee... Uh, that he wasn't asked to give any more toasts and he got to peacefully enjoy his supper after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. Which is fantastic, yeah. <laughs> the other thing people don't do anymore is give their books insanely, ludicrously long titles because they just oh, use the I cover page to describe the whole book. Yeah. And uh, so the title of this book is... Whew, are you ready? 
On account of Colonel Crockett's tour to the north and down east in the year of our Lord 1834, his object being to examine the grand manufacturing establishments of the country and also to find out the condition of its literature and morals, the extent of its commerce, and the practical operation. Or, <laughs> the experiment. <laughs> or... <laughs> I take it he just wanted a title that lasted as long as the journey itself did. It's, it's so He was good. just, you know, he was, he was mirroring the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the more boring parts of the, uh, <laughs> of the expedition. I long for the days when the front page of a book was just the TR. Too long didn't read summary of the book itself. That's or so great. a two-word snappy title. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, at, at some point somebody came along and was like, you know... You know the second bit. What about if maybe, like, maybe we could just put that on the front? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there were people who said, "Don't be stupid. How, could you How do ridiculous! That? How will people know exactly what they're buying? How will people uh, well, judge a book know, but for by its cover?" I, I, I feel like you know we could like use a bit of design and make it look cool, put a picture on the front, and yeah. you can imagine these sort of stuffy prescriptivist people being like. Pictures are not for the front of books. Shut up, sit down. Yeah. What a stupid idea. Get out of here, Dave. Who are these whippersnappers with their pictures and their snappy titles? Your dumb ideas. Also, there's an <laughs> inspirational quote Blizzard. on the front cover of this book, too. It says, when thou dost read a book, do not turn the leaves only, but gather the fruit. Oh. Right? Good work. Well done, Davy Crockett. This is beautiful. Yeah. Uh... I'm going to have, incidentally, I will post the, uh, I, I got a, P I grabbed a PDF of the page that the quote comes from and the front cover, and I'll throw those up on our Patreon oh, page sweet. for people to admire, because they're just neat to look at. But yeah, yeah. massive cover. I love anyway. free books on the internet. Um, Blizzard, back to Blizzard, that was sort of a tangent. So, uh, the first use to mean a winter storm in writing, again, came in 1859. The OED has, like, one from 59 and then one more from uh, 1876. But it wasn't until the 1880s that it became really widely used. At mm -hmm. least, like, newspapers started using it. It started becoming ubiquitous. And as, did it, you know, did it spike in usage because of a blizzard, a series of blizzards? It spiked in use because the, the winter of 80 and 81, 1880, 1881, was so mm -hmm. ludicrously terrible Oh, that nice. people in the U.S. just, they started needing a word for garbage winter weather that was harsher than any words they'd been using so far. Like, they just had to have something cool. to describe this winter. Um, so Laura Ingalls Wilder of Little House on the Prairie fame, she wrote a book called The Long Winter about that, oh. about that winter. And she talks about having, like, because it destroyed like railway lines and blocked railroads all over the place and cut off basically everyone from everyone else in these little villages on the Dakotas and Montana and stuff and talks about like the coal ran out so they had to spend their days like I guess braiding or twisting hay into sticks that they could burn and it would hopefully last wow. longer than just burning hay and they'd made bread from like grinding seeds into seed flour when the wheat all ran out like just brutal terrible stuff but Laura Ingalls Wilder's whole, you know, the whole Little House on the Prairie series, uh, it's it's one of those beautiful examples of this is so interesting to read about, but I'm so glad I never have to experience this stuff. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I, I genuinely loved those books as, as a kid, as, as so many people did. But, you know, I, I used to, even as a child, I would find myself thinking, you know, to kind of get back to Canada, like, why would you go to those places? Yeah, exactly. Just just leave them alone. They've, just, they've been there a long time. Just live somewhere else. Yeah, just try <laughs> something else. Yeah. So, and it, it's interesting. I found a couple. So, like, it, it's one of these winters that became folkloric in its intensity mm. and extremity. And I did some brief looking. I, I did find, like meteorological research papers that talk about how it was it was actually like there's evidence to show that it was genuinely a terrible 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 year people weren't just being british about it it wasn't yeah it wasn't just people going all london about the weather <laughs> it was genuinely a horrific um a horrific year so it's um 
Yeah. Anyway, so the blizzard, the winter was so bad that it started being used uh, more perva- more pervasively and just generally as uh, a word meaning winter storm. Etymologically, as far as the actual etymology of the word, which I suppose we should get to, is uh, <laughs> I, I like it when the OED sort of does what we do when we try to pronounce German and we go, I don't know, how about this? Um <laughs> It says it's probably more or less onomatopoeic, which I feel like is a, I mean, not to slag on the OED, I feel like that's a bit of a lax use of onomatopoeia, because blizzards don't sound, they, they, you, you know, don't go outside and hear blizzard, 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 As blizzard, soon blizzard. as you started talking about it, I started to think about how blizzard fits beautifully into that category of onomatopoeia that are not really onomatopoeia, but kind of they are. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... It suggests a connection with words like blow, plast, blister, or bluster. Okay. And how that people might have just been searching around for a word that sounded like those and had the same kind of force and ended up with blizzard. There's some conjecture that it's related to French blessé, which means to wound, which goes back to that um, other definition meaning to strike or blow or shoot or whatever. But it says, the OED says, uh, quote, there is nothing to indicate a French origin, period. So... They seem to close. If that's the door. what they say. That's what they say. They seem to close the door on that. So anyway, but the interesting thing here is that there is some evidence, and this goes back to the spoken versus written first use, is that it's actually slightly hard to tell because the earliest uses of blizzard to mean snowstorm all specifically reference the fact that people are calling it this. Okay. Like nobody in print says, "I shall call it this." They mm-hmm. all say. These things, which are known as blizzards, are striking the blah, blah, blah. And so it's actually kind of hard to tell whether, like when Davy Crockett uses it, I guess Colonel Crockett, because he's not on TV yet, um, (laughs) when he uses it to mean just a rip-roaring, shut up and let me eat my dinner, terrible toast, whether he's using it figuratively for that because it was already meant generally to mean a snowstorm, like a terrible snowstorm, yeah, I, I or suppose, whether I mean, it went it, the other it, way. It, it, yeah, it can both, you know, he, he kind of bashed them with this unexpected and slightly impolite toast. Yeah, so it... it or whether blow. it was adapted from the word meaning a sharp blow or strike or wound or whatever, and then adapted from there to mean, what the hell is the weather doing to us <laughs> down the road? So it, it could have gone either way. So it's, it's just one of those interesting things where it's like, oh yeah, I, I could see both... Mm. sides of it and just because it's in there first it was written down first with the one meaning especially since there's like it's in the same century it's 1820 versus 1860 it's by no means impossible that it meant either one of them first and then was adapted to mean the other but anyway so that's uh that's blizzard cool because it's snowing out right now once again, because I am sitting in the room where I record this podcast, looking at a bookshelf full, it's largely full of DVDs because we still have those right. and um, some books. But uh, just like last time I was looking at Roger's Profanosaurus and it, it kind of struck me. Yeah. But I'm sitting right opposite a series of DVDs by Eddie Izzard. Oh, awesome. Very, very excellent comedian. And just, you know, purely because it's so similar to the word blizzard, I I wondered where, you know, is there any particular history to the surname? Etymologically, it's, it bears absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to the snowy or indeed the blowy word. Okay. But I, I had a quick Google and it turns out it's a word that sort of family tradition within the Izzard family has it that the name is des- derived from the name Isolde, the wife of Tristram, nephew of the King of Cornwall of the great Arthurian legends. Ooh. So Izzard is a much, much older name than Blizzard is. Um, and the f- surname was first found in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire, excuse me, where they held a family seat from ancient times, being granted lands in that shire soon after the Norman conquest in 1066. Wow. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I hate to correct uh, you, I to believe it's with, pronounced with Gloucestershire. Gloucester, yes. <laughs> it may as well be. Yeah. Why not? For all that do, there's do any sort of Do you follow Eddie Izzard on Twitter? I'm, I don't You're not really, on Twitter, really. I, I, no, not particularly. I think I, I don't know that I consciously do, but yeah. he's the sort of guy I would follow. That man is running 
28 marathons in 28 days in 28 different countries. Oh, he did that already. Is he doing it again? Yeah. He's yeah. up to like he's, he's a maniac. 16th marathon in as many days in as many different countries. Like, I can't even... He is a, a wonderful, fantastic maniac. Yeah. I watched a great documentary about him while he was doing marathons last time. And it was it was about his, you know, they focus quite a lot on his drive. And yeah, he's he's just he's a maniac. I think it's it's the it's the best way to put it. And an hour later his makeup looks perfect. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. He's a, he said we, we went to see him last October, I think it was. Oh yeah. Um yeah, we went for Ross's birthday and he said that, that this was his last comedy tour because he was going to go into politics. Hmm. Which is, uh, yeah, incredibly interesting. And I would heartily support that. Yeah. But neat. whether or not that's a, a back burner plan or it's not gone to plan or he's changed his mind or whatever, but... The marathon thing yeah, just he's, blows me away. He's the absolute epitome of um, if you want to do it badly enough, you can do it. It's crazy. Anyway, yes. So what have cool. you got for us today? What have I got? Well, I quite enjoyed my um, Greek Lego word last week. I yep. like to call them that. You know, take two pieces, slot them together, you have a thing. Yeah. So another one this week, sarcophagus. Oh, awesome. I love this word. I don't know what it means. Now, it's also yeah, cool. I, I love this word too, because I thought I knew what it meant. At least I, I had a sort of a vague, yeah, yeah, sure, I could talk about that. Oh, no way, I don't actually know very much about it kind of experience. Right. So here's here's what I found. So it is a noun and the OED defines it as a kind of stone reputed among the Greeks to have the property of consuming the flesh of dead bodies deposited in it. Oh. And consequently used for coffins. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. So it's this is a note noted to be an obsolete definition uh, except in ancient history. And we have from 1601, from a translation of Pliny's History of the World, Volume 2, near unto Assos, a city in Troas, there is found in the quarries a certain stone called sarcophagus. And then in 1680, round about then, we have his entrails are like the sarcophagus that devours dead bodies in a small space. So the stone itself that was devouring dead bodies, uh, consuming the flesh... It's it's very much a kimbap of a word, seaweed rice. <laughs> um, a sarcophagus, whether it's a coffin and that kind of symbolic, moving on from that point way, or whether it's a stone that literally consumes the flesh of dead bodies, it does exactly what it says on the tin. But when I started to look at the, at the Lego blocks themselves, I found that they were interesting. Okay. So, Etam Online also has that citation of a type of stone used for coffins, which the OED has as its second definition, from Latin sarcophagus, which comes from Le excuse me, Greek sarcophagus. And it, it seems, oh, uh, Etam Online mentions that the stone in question is limestone. Right. Literally flesh-eating in reference to the supposed action of this type of limestone. So that's the idea. Hmm. The Greek word sarx, S-A-R-X, means flesh. And phagain, or phagain, however you choose to pronounce your ancient Greek, means to eat. Wonderfully, both of these have pirates. Awesome. So let's, let's dive on into that. Super duper happy about Pi just now because I have been hearing all about Grimm's law and how Proto-Indo-European works through its sound changes and how you can reverse engineer words back to their pirates. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have that kind of thinking about it. The pirate for the fadjain or fagin part of the word comes from the Proto-Indo-European -Indo root bag, that's B-H-A-G, which means to share out a portion or to get a share. Now, I quite like this. This is a very democratic way of looking at eating. I'm the youngest of four and my kind of unofficial catchphrase within the family is leave some for me. <laughs> because, right. you know, the, the sharing out of the food, that doesn't always happen terribly well. And my mum always tells the story of, of when she was a kid. Her father always got the biggest portion of meat, you know, like noticeably so. 
until they were, you know, really quite old children living at home, it was always the case that dad got the biggest bit. So whether, whatever kind of sharing out accompanies your experiences of eating, this is where we, we have this, this uh, fagine coming from. Oh. It forms all or part of aphagia, in other words, being unable to eat. Okay. Interestingly, the Bhagavad Gita, the great Hindu uh, sacred text, yeah. it also gives us bakshish, esophagus, nebish, that's an interesting one. Yeah. It gives us to pagoda. And really? these prefixes or parts of words phage or phago or phagus. It gives us to porgy and then lastly sarcophagus. Wow. Pagoda, a sacred tower richly adorned, is uh, perhaps from a corruption of Persian butkada, meaning idol dwelling. However, hmm. It's the other idea here is, is perhaps from or influenced by Tamil, Bhagavadi, which means house belonging to a deity, from Sanskrit, Bhagavati, meaning goddess, which mm. means uh, coming from Bhaga as in good fortune. So this the sense that a pagoda is a place to, a place that has, has had a good share. Yeah. A share of good fortune. But yeah, interesting, interesting one. That's neat. So that gives us the, the phagus bit of the word sarcophagus then we consider the sarx part so we said it's a very straightforward etymology greek sarx and then that follow it follows on into latin and then comes to us in the english word sarcophagus however etym online directed me to sarcasm to have a look at the pi root for this particular word Oh, that's cool. It had never, ever occurred to me that sarcasm and sarcophagus were related. Yeah. But they are. Because sarcasm literally means to strip off the flesh. Yes. I, yeah, okay. It's all coming back to me now. I did know that about yeah. sarcasm, but that's... I'm enjoying this a great deal. Now, it's also my favourite pie route to date. So Etym Online says... It means to speak bitterly or sneer, literally to strip off the flesh from sarx, the genitive of sarcos, meaning flesh, or properly a piece of meat. Traditionally from pie root, twerk. Yep, twerk. <laughs> and twerk means to cut. So huh. the source here is the, uh, also of Avesta and Thuarez to cut. I really enjoy this phrase. I had to go and do a little looking up, a, a wee side project. So... Source also of Avesta and Thuari is to cut, but beaks is dubious. <laughs> yep, that was an appropriate space to go, what? That's fantastic. And so I, I discovered that Robert Stephen Paul Beeks was a Dutch linguist who was emeritus professor of comparative Indo-European linguistics at uh... Leiden University and an author of many monographs on the Proto-Indo-European language. Now, I don't know about you, but there's such... Such academic weight behind that phrase. Beaks was dubious. Beaks I found was myself dubious. thinking, wow. well, you know, if Beaks is dubious, then I don't know if I believe it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we to so, question Beaks? Well, exactly. I certainly wouldn't wouldn't get up all in Beaks's face. So a very simple etymology from two pirates, cutting and eating. Cutting, I, I like that, that this became flesh because, you know, I don't tend to think about my body being made of the same stuff that I, you know, chop up and munch on occasionally when I right. eat meat. But yeah. at the same time, intellectually, I'm well aware that I am made of that same stuff. What does human taste like? <laughs> but um, It's yeah, for so, dinner. So from, from cutting to flesh... From flesh to flesh being eaten, right to a space for that thing to happen, a coffin, sarcophagus. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. I, off the top, I like the idea of. Every now and then, I I kind of think back to things like the humors or, the sort of four elements, mm -hmm. you know, earth, air, fire, water, like, and how. Th explanations for natural phenomenon before all the information was available 
which I guess is all the time, but before as much information was available, they often just make so much sense. Yeah, sure. And you look at them and you go, yeah, of course. Of course that's the way you explain that because I can see how, that, like, <clears throat> of course you figure that wood contain is made up of earth and fire because it comes out of the earth and you can burn it and fire comes mm. out of it. And so fire yeah, sure. was in it there. And so, the, like, and so the idea of this type of stone that we use for coffins eats away at flesh when you don't necessarily have a full or as full a grasp on the actual process of decomposition. Mm. Of course, it you know you open up, you put a body in the cough in the sarcophagus, and then for whatever reason down the road you open it up and the body is decomposed, and you're like, well, well that's obviously what happens when it goes into Nothing's come in or box. out. It's in this rock. <laughs> It must be the rock. And people kind of go, ha, 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 these people. But it's like, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It also speaks, too, to the notion that they, um, they they looked after their bodies carefully. You know, they didn't leave them lying around to rot in the sun. Yeah. Now, in, a, in a climate like Greece, I'd imagine that's a, as much a practical concern as, as a respect for the dead kind of concern. But yeah. Also, you know, if you've decided that this is the box where that process of the flesh being eaten happens, then it happens in the box. In other words, it doesn't happen in other places. It's the rock that does it. Right. So if the bodies are just lying around and they're not in the boxes, you would start to think, oh, wait, it's not the stone. What's going on here? And thus science is invented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, really I was cool. talking to a friend um, about correlation versus causation this week. Yes. Which is a hugely interesting rabbit hole to, to get yourself down in so many different directions. But she is a, a trained public health scientist. And so, you know, she she's very pernickety sometimes about generalizations and, and statements that, that I particularly that I make because I make so many of these statements. And what I said to her was, you know, I I'm a sucker for causation, correlation mix ups because I love a good story. First mm -hmm. and foremost, I'll always take a, a cool story over a, a slightly dull scientific fact. Um, and, and what I said to her was, stories are older than science. Yeah. So I think, I think there's something particularly human about the fact that most people will take a good story over the actual facts of, you know, this isn't very interesting, but we've proved it using scientific method. It's a robust method. And... If you'd say that that's not the case anymore, then frankly, you're wrong. People are like, oh, yeah, OK. But what about this really, really cool stone that, that eats the flesh? Yeah. My favourite. Fortunately, quote. most etymologies seem to favour stories rather than science. So yeah, so it's handy. My favourite correlation yeah. versus causation place on the internet has long been, uh, you can Google it, it's, it's Google it as spurious correlations. I think I've seen this. This is Dude, it's Tyler one of my Vigan most faves. Or vegan or something, and yeah, he just basically does charts where he doc like sort of. There's some arranging of the data in the charts, but you know correlates things like the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool with films Nicolas Cage appeared in on any given Tyler year. Vigen. That's that's the guy's name. Per capita cheese dot com. Yeah. Per capita cheese consumption based on or correlates with the number of people who died by becoming <laughs> tangled in their bed sheets. The, like, uh, the the top one on his on his website at the moment is U.S. spending on science, space, and technology correlates with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Yeah, like just there's so and it, many, and it does, it really does. Yeah, and you look at the two, the lines, and they, you know, they're all total the revenue same generated line. by arcades correlates with the computer science doctorates awarded in the U.S. Like it's. <laughs> It's fantastic. They're great, I, great pairs of charts. I love this charts. stuff. Um, I love a chart and a graph, basically. Um, do, do you know, I've probably spoken to you about this before, do you know the comedian Dave Gorman? Uh, yes. He, he, he also yes. loves a graph. And most of his sort of stand-up DVDs, like his stand-up shows, are based around a PowerPoint presentation of information about, you know, whatever thing it is that he's been investigating. But yeah, I, I have the same sort of... I, I don't I don't always like what they tell me, but I do like investigating them. Graphs and maps. We're back to Sporkle again. Yeah, graphs and maps are awesome. Who doesn't love a map? I, I was wondering about the... Did you look into Coffin? 
I did not. The connection of How coffin? Because I, I, whenever I hear sarcophagus, I always thought, now, probably not because the phagus part of sarcophagus is one and the sarco part. It's like the helicopter thing where the component yeah, parts yeah, of helicopter sure. are not heli and copter. They're helico and pter. Um, Which is such a great little nugget. It's my favorite little truth nugget for a while now. Yeah, it's great. But I, I looked up oh, coffin on Adam coffin. online. And it, coffin is from Greek coffinos, meaning basket. Yeah, and I, I, it throws you off by pointing that it's from Old French coffin, meaning sarcophagus, but not necessarily because there's a particular connection there, which is which is interesting. Mm. So, I, yeah. I would imagine purely from manufacturing point of view that basket coffins predate stone coffins. Um, but so does that mean that a coffin was... Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Just to fill people I, in who I, I aren't mean, looking at this right now, the coffin, Edom Online, entry for coffins as it's early 14th century, a chest or box for valuables. And then the mm. the main secondary sense before it became related to funerals was uh, a pie crust, a mold or a casing of pastry for a pie in the oh. late 14th century. And then 1520s on, uh, it became uh, a, a chest or box in which the dead human body is placed for burial was like sort of 1520s, but it was always the secondary sense in the early This time. is so great. Yeah. A pie dish or a mould was also a coffin. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And also gross. Like, I mean... But cool. We love pie in all its forms. I do love pie. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Blizzard yes. sarcophagus. Blizzard sarcophagus. Okay. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.